everybody, it's Angela, and I just wanted to um, share with you my multimodal synthesis. I decided to put together several ideas that uh, have emerged within this course, both things that I've learned anew, and then also work and research that I'm doing that um, dovetails with a lot of the things that we covered this semester. So you might remember the Adobe Spark that I created where I talked about students as epic heroes in online courses. This comes from an idea that started a few years back. It was actually a um, presentation that I did for the Online Learning Consortium that was built on this idea, and these are all the presentations that we've done on this um, in the past, um, but it was built on this idea that came up at a webinar that we were watching for a cool tool, um, Powtoon, uh, basically a, an animated sort of like video explainer uh, drawing type of tool. It's super cool. You should check it out if you don't know it. But um, Powtoon was talking about the creation of the videos with the um, this particular tool. And uh, they said, well, what if you were making a video that was, tr was trying to sell a product? What if you thought about that um, product uh, story as being part of a person that's on an epic journey? And they introduced me and my colleague, Kathy Russell, to this idea of uh, Joseph Campbell's monomyth, which it was the first time we had, we had heard pieces of the hero's journey, but we didn't know about Joseph Campbell yet. So we fell down this rabbit hole and we said, huh, what would it be to create uh, online courses around this notion where the student is established as the epic hero of the course? So fast forward a couple of years, um, a series of presentations, lots of papers that we've written, all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and this website that I'm on right now, monomythonline.com that we created that talks about this idea of um, having epic heroes within the online course design process. Now, this has expanded in a lot of different ways and a lot of the, the themes that have been um, created and emphasized by this particular uh, project, the framework that we created. So we actually have um, a document that people can use to lesson plan around this idea. Um, all of this goodness, it ends up supporting things that we just know about the online environment in general, just like um, constructivist learning. So learning where the student is actually building knowledge, that's super important. Um, that uh, when you're creating learning experiences, you have to be able to honor the unique perspectives and abilities of the learners that are in your classroom. And that storytelling is a really powerful element within um, teaching and learning, whether it's online or not. All of those elements were, um, we found in our research, were really supported by this notion of weaving um, the learning experience around the monomyth, super cool. Um, one sort of extension to this class was that I saw this in all of the lessons that we created, particularly the um, co-facilitated uh, lessons that the grad students put together. So for the one that Sam and I did, particularly the escape room, but certainly not also the, or certainly also the, um, the, uh, the annotation jam within the escape room folks had to take this notion of close reading and uh, apply teamwork collaboration uh, unique ideas and goals uh, constructivism it was all rooted around a story <laughs> of us crashing into the sun um, so again those themes of constructivism uh, multiplicity of literacies and then narrative and storytelling all supported by that learning experience too. So that was amazing to see uh, these interdisciplinary applications uh, in action. So with the monomyth in particular, the way that the work has been evolving and changing is that we spend a lot of time talking about um, these narrative principles and typically we use games in order to teach people these narrative principles. And it's very meta because <laughs> um, games involve stories. Stories um, quite often can be woven around games. Um, we're trying to teach storytelling 
um, and teach narrative practices by using games, but the games themselves also might be built around narrative and storytelling. Okay, I know your heads might be a little bit <laughs> blown by all of that, um, but I'll give you an example. So this is a game that I created um, about a year and a half ago, and it's based on the Oregon Trail. So for those of you um, that are uh, old school like me, or maybe not old school, you just really like to play old games, you'll probably remember this, <laughs> creating your wagon party. I created a character named Little Donks, very important. Um, and it was just this really simple game that was trying to teach the historical um, journey of the Oregon Trail but it did it in this way that has sort of been imprinted on um, folks' uh, consciousness over the years. And it certainly is revered and has a lot of love for um, all sorts of ridiculous stuff, including uh, the <laughs> crazy sort of uh, indulgent nature of us when we go hunting. Um, I, I know that those of you that played the Oregon Trail knew you couldn't carry back more than 10 pounds of squirrel, but you still shot that buffalo. Um, <laughs> that was a part of the game experience. So we decided to take the dead notion of this beloved game that, that had since been convert, converted by Pressman into a card game and turn it into this sort of co-op experience that people could play about online courses. I am a perennial optimist. I am very surprised that I ended up making a game that was so desperate and so dire. Um, you can play it. The downloadable pieces are here on this website. and I'll drop the URL in there for you too. But basically it's a co-op game that has folks trying to keep students in an online course, even though there are all of these sort of um, class conundrums that may happen, like the LMS goes down, the PDFs aren't accessible, the teacher hasn't given any feedback, um, all sorts of, of different things that could happen and you can counteract them with different things like instructional technology support, you can get a design team together, you can play a universal design for learning card to make your PDFs accessible, so all sorts of these things. And people hold the cards in their hand and they have to go through different rounds of helping each other get through these situations. But one of the big findings is that their resources are limited um, as they're as they're playing this game. So this is one example of how we've sort of extended this idea of you have the learning content, you have the outcomes that you want to use, but the affordances of um, of creativity, of interpersonal connections, of storytelling, of multimodal learning, all can come together into this learning experience as a game that can be given to students to support or in this instance, the students are faculty and, and staff, but um, can support constructivist learning. Amazing. So um, fast forward to the heart of this synthesis, I decided to do some 360 video and I decided to do it around a game that one of my other colleagues created. So Keegan Lone Wheeler, um, amazing, amazing scholar within instructional technology and gameful learning. He created a game that talks about the three parts of the, the Monomyth Online framework that we created. So the people that are part of the framework, the paths that folks take within the framework, and the, the practices. So it used to be methods, but we had to go with three Ps because why not? Um, the practices that people engage in. So um, if you're using badging within your course, that would be an example of, of a practice. So he made a storytelling game as well. And um, this particular game has people um, collecting cards. You get four cards, you can kind of trade those cards, and then you have to craft a story around an online learning experience. And you can take the perspective of any person or anything within the online, online journey. So um, I got to play this game at the OLC Innovate conference in Denver. I was actually helping to facilitate a team that was playing it. We all told stories and then we voted on the story that we liked the best. Um, and it was such an amazing experience, one that, you know, I don't think I've ever had um, as positive of feedback as I have leaving a session and then also seeing it on the, the session evaluations and things like that because people were in the driver's seat from the get-go and they were talking about real challenges and real constraints that they faced in a way that was super helpful to them, um, contextualized around these metaphors that we gave them within the hero's journey. And again, I'll give you the link to this Keegan's game. He makes it available for you to download. We make everything open. 
um, and, and shareable for, for people to use. Um, but it's super, it's super awesome to play. And um, I thought, huh, wouldn't it be fun to combine all of these different pieces that I need to for this multimodal synthesis of um, gameplay, of the creation of games, of the interpersonal connections that come from sharing practice with 360 video that was synchronous. So a lot of the 360 video examples that we interact with, um, they tend to be asynchronous um, when we're consuming them. So we see a video that's been processed and sort of completed. But I wanted to show an example of how 360 video could be used live. And um, a tool that we have access to within the College of Education, oh, and it, it changed <laughs> before I was going to talk about it, um, is the um, the meeting owl. So it actually, you'll see in the next slide, it looks like an owl. Um, when you plug it in, um, it says, hi, I'm meeting owl. And sometimes it hoots. It hoots for certain people. I, I adore it. I love owls in general, but I love this particular owl even more so. And um it will take with this camera that's up on top um, a panorama of a video for you. So you actually get um, a full view of all of the nonverbal and verbal communication that's happening at a meeting as it's happening live. So you can see this entire um, 360 panorama, but as you talk, the meeting owl will focus on the person that's talking and split the screen. So this in particular is great for things that are highly nuanced. Like if somebody is saying something and then this person over here is agreeing, you might not see that on a regular video meeting if you're attending virtually. You would miss those nonverbal communication cues. And um, this is one of those tools that, that really helps us to connect with a lot of people um, not only all over the country, but all over the world and making them feel like they're a part of, um, of what, what's happening. So I talked to Keegan. I said, hey, would you be interested in helping me make this 360 video? We're going to play your card game. Turns out he wanted to play the card game as part of um, a networking um, group that we founded called the Squad Goals Network, where we um, hold these salons on Zoom and just have educators come and chat and share what's bothering them or what, not really what's bothering them, but what they're working on, um, challenges that they face, and we do it in sort of a collegial informal way. So he was going to actually have us play this card game on um, the next Squad Goals Network call. So I said, why don't we use the Meeting Owl to play um, your game? And we will put together, we will synthesize all sorts of amazing things. So right now, if you're keeping score at home, we've talked about um, Monomyth Online and the Hero's Journey. We've talked about constructivism. We've talked about the multiplicity of literacies, of storytelling and narrative. We've talked about gameful learning principles. And now we're talking about interpersonal connections over synchronous online video. Pume. <laughs> <laughs> so, so much. So um, I'm going to take a break from talking to you for a second, and I'm going to show you the gameplay. Um, you can fast forward through the gameplay and then just go straight to my final reflection if you don't watch it, want to watch it all. But if you're really interested in um, listening and watching, to, watching a bunch of educators talk about challenges that they face in the online learning environment, based on the cards that they were dealt. That's such a great metaphor. Um, you can you can watch that through. But otherwise, um, you can fast forward to this timestamp that I've put here to see um, uh, just my final reflection on all of my findings from recording this video. All right, so my name is Keegan Long Wheeler. I'm an educational technologist at the University of Oklahoma. That just means that I work with faculty members on their uh, fun and exciting technology products from iPads and blogging to uh, weird game ideas in what they do. Um, so uh, if I had to choose what an avatar would be, my best representation, my soulmate, definitely would be a hedgehog. Awesome. I'm Angela Gunder. I am the Director of Instructional Design and Curriculum Development at the University of Arizona within the Office of Digital Learning. And um, that just means I get to hang out with a lot of cool people and help them answer questions and solve problems about building online courses. And my avatar would be Ursula, Sea Witch Extraordinaire, because she was a misunderstood hero of her times. And she was just a businesswoman trying to make a living. So uh, that's, that's it. <laughs>
I'm Chris Ziska Strange. I'm an instructional designer at the Office of Digital Learning. Um, and my avatar, actually my legit avatar and a lot of my stuff is um, the I have no what I, idea what I'm doing dog in the, uh, the graduation guard. It's like sitting there really scared. Just, okay, cool. Um, is it gonna to change to Doctor Strange when you're done with your PhD? It is gonna strange change to Doctor Strange when I get the PhD. I've worked too hard for this. <laughs> Dan, you're up. Oh man. Okay. So I'm Dan Whitaker. I'm an instructional designer with the Office of Digital Learning at the University of Arizona. Um, if I had to pick an avatar, <laughs> I'm not sure what would best depict me. Um, I guess a lot of people have called me a wizard. <laughs> so maybe a wizard that might fit. Nice pointy hat. <laughs> are you a, an evil wizard or are you an evil of, or an evil of good? A wizard? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's opinions there. <laughs> good question. I don't know. To be ter determined. <laughs> <laughs> and Ryan closing us out. Um. Ryan Strait, I'm an assistant professor at UA South in informatics, educational technology, and cyber operations. Um, and I don't really know about the avatar. I think maybe just because it's been on my mind lately, maybe uh, maybe Alice from Alice in Wonderland or one of the characters from that, because I'm full a full supporter of the idea that you should be tumbling down every rabbit hole that you can find. So maybe while Chris is cutting, I can talk a little bit about what I was hoping to accomplish today. And then Keegan, do you want to kind of walk us through what you were thinking, how we could play this? Um, yeah. For locations. Does everybody have a copy of the cards by chance? I definitely didn't send it to Ryan, but I can send it to him right now. I don't okay. have a copy either. I sent them to you. You sent them to me? Yeah. Via afternoon ish. Afternoon ish. Yep. Yes. Hold on, I'm going to send you the, the copy right now. Afternoon ish. Is he yesterday? Mm hmm. I think so. I can send them again so that they're on the top of your email. That would be great because I don't have anything from you afternoon ish. <laughs> Maybe that's just when my computer decided it was time for me to see that email. Yeah, maybe. That seems to be a thing right now. Sense. Okay, so I was trying to kill a bunch of birds with one stone. Basically, um, I wanted to do a demo of 360 video. What moved the meeting at all? And um, as part of it, I wanted to show that 360 video can be synchronous and it can be, because um, a lot of times it's like film the 360 video and then um, just share it with people where they can explore it later. And um, I wanted to create something that would show that it could be synchronous, but it could also be, uh, I don't even know how to say it, like that people could be tuning in from different locations. So it's not really hybrid because we're all online, but um, how we're tuning in and how we're doing this is um, slightly different depending on our, on our location. So I thought that it would be fun for us to play um, the game that Keegan put together that we played at Innovate. And Ryan, you didn't play the game, did you? Were you in that session? You might have been in that session. At this last one? Uh huh. No. You would remember. <laughs> You'd remember this game. So um, I asked Keegan, hey, can we play this game together in some sort of weird configuration? And he said, yes, you're stealing my idea for my salon, but sure. <laughs> Uh, I said, oh, it's a dress rehearsal. So um, I thought that we could show the, both the affordances of um, synchronous online meetings, the affordances of 360 video, the affordances of those technology tools and capturing nonverbal communication in some sort of activity. 
um, the affordances of using narrative and um, in course design or really in any sort of online learning practices. And that's it. Did you have any outcomes that you wanted to see, Keegan? Other than hang out um, for another one I of mean, your ideas? <laughs> I just I just want to see that it's fun. So okay. <laughs> So maybe that should be your goal today, is just focus on, tell Keegan if this is fun or not. I think it's fun, but <laughs> I'm biased. Okay. Um, so one thing I was thinking um, uh, in terms of, so Angela and Chris, you all have cards on site. Dan, are you, um, what are, I am trying to print them right now. Oh, you're printing them? Okay. Oh, yeah, I um, guess I, I should print them too. You, yeah, so the, the, the only way I could see us getting around that is if, like, you two played with my deck and basically I just sent you the, like, what your hand was and then you referenced from the files. That's um, what I would be the quickest. And then you guys don't have to worry about printing and cutting them out. That, like, he'll deal... And then he'll tell you what cards to look at on the PDF that are your cards. Yeah. Okay. That'll work. Does that work? Yeah. yeah Save you that's... time because Chris just cut a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's crack she's, time. She's awesome like that. But Being told what cards to look at and what to do was very reminiscent of my first time playing Euchre. This is fun. <laughs> is that it? Where, when was that? Like a decade ago. I don't know. There's like so much Euchre talk lately. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely hate it. I um, I don't know how to play it. When I was at Eli in, no, I was at Upsia in Seattle. They had like a heated euchre battle evening. It looks like Keegan's drinking a bottle of ketchup. It which does. Which is <laughs> 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 <That's> fantastic. <laughs> Why well, get V8 when you can just drink ketchup? I know. Listen, get your tomatoes however you can. <laughs> there was a lady at the uh, at the gym yesterday drinking out of um, a Hershey's ketchup bottle. Like she she needed a water bottle, and I thought I guess she thought it was funny or whatever. But she's like running on the treadmill, and then all of a sudden she brings up like this ketchup bottle, drinks out of it, and puts it back, and I'm trying not to stare, but failing miserably. Okay, you do you, lady. You do you. <laughs> I hope water. <laughs> Maybe she was just having a really rough day, and that was how she dealt. Um, but she was drinking very fast, so I'm assuming it's not chocolate syrup. Don't judge her. <laughs> no judgment whatsoever. <laughs> She's a really good drinker. Okay. So, Keegan, guide us. Yep. Lead us. All right. Sounds good. So basically how it's going to go, um, and I'm also kind of like modifying this as we go because it's uh, also flexible and should be fine, is um, what I think would be easier since um, Angela and Chris, you are two people, is if you all just want to basically shuffle your deck and just have it as a pile, we'll just play from piles basically is what we can do. Um, and then you can draw okay. from the top. Um, yeah. So if you'll just shuffle them up into a pile, um, because I think this will be like the, the passing mechanic. What we'll do is we'll change it to a drawing mechanic for this, basically. So you'll, um, uh, you'll have the opportunity to discard cards and redraw from the top of the pile is what you'll have. Um, okay. But let me, let me go over the rules real quick and then... Wait. Uh, Want me to do any grounding on the monomyth pieces real fast, like the thirty-six? Yeah. If do you want to do that before instructions or after? Up to you. Uh, let's do let's do it after, just because I think if you want to, um, yeah, let's just do it after. I think. Okay. Um, all right. So. Let me turn off my notifications too, because Kate Sonka is messaging me about her happiness of her new icon on Twitter. Um, Which, all right. <laughs> in case anybody wants to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So 
basically what what's going to happen is you'll have a randomized deck and um, you'll draw four off the top. So what I'm going to do for both Ryan and Dan is I'll alternate. So this is mine. This is Dan's. This is Ryan's basically. And I'll have the decks like here basically is what I'll do. Um, and then I will, what I'm going to do for Dan and Ryan is I'm actually going to message you like privately in the thing, um, what cards you have. Um, and then you'll message me back which card you would like to discard. So you're going to get two opportunities to discard. Um, and you're going to hold at the end of it. You'll have uh, four cards in your hand is what you'll have. Um, so, uh, there are two types of cards. There are character cards and there are stage cards. The stage cards are the, um, in this case, 12 stages of the hero's journey is what they are. And what you will do is you will, from what you receive, you will construct a narrative around um, those heroes and those stages in the, in the hero's journey around your current experiences or past experiences in online learning, whether it's from a instructional design standpoint, from a teaching standpoint, from a student standpoint, if you want to do that. Um, really, it's like to prime and get you thinking about like where some of these things fall within your current um, or, you know, past professional life or whatever it is. Um, so you can be as creative as you want. Um, in the past, we've had folks talk about how like Things like characters are actually related to items. So like maybe the trickster is actually a syllabus or something like that. Um, so you can like change it up however you want. Um, the reluctance to accept the call, you know, I don't know what you're going to attribute that to in a, in a course or in course design or in working with faculty, but... <laughs> <laughs> Stuff. I'm not building discussion boards in my class. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. So, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. So you'll have the the opportunity to basically create a narrative around. Um, it'll be a prompted narrative around the, the cards that you receive, based on your experience in online learning. Is what it's going to be. Okay. Are there any questions about that part so far? All right. Um, Ryan, you're that... mute. <laughs> I forgot. I, I, hit, I was trying to open the chat, and I accidentally muted myself. That's the trash truck, and I totally forgot to take the trash out. I got to run out and take the trash cans down real quick across the street <laughs> for when the Do truck it. comes back. So, yeah, I'll be right back. Go. Do it. Um, let's... Um, trying to think of anything I really want him to wear it. so we have four cards and we use all four of those for the one narrative yes story that you and, create that. and you're gonna get some opportunities to discard some cards that maybe you don't want to use um, and then those go to Ryan and I guess Chris and I are we just gonna exchange with each other well, rather than having um, that happen I thought we'd just have a draw pile so rather than passing you'll just draw a new card from your pile. Great. Because we have few enough players that that will work. Um, few, well, excuse me. We have few enough players per deck that that will work rather than having the pass mechanic. Uh, okay. So get, it'll just be easier for us. Two passes? Yeah, so two draws is what you'll get. Yeah. Yeah. So we want to have at least one of each type of card, but if we had three of one and one of the other, it would we could still construct a decent narrative out of it, probably. I mean, you can, yeah, you can do it with whatever whatever you get because when we played it previously, like we had, um, um, I think I had one individual in my group that all she got was stage cards. <laughs> she had no she had no characters necessarily, but she still constructed a story around what it was. So okay. it's not really necessarily about like the blending of them. Statistically speaking, you should receive one, but right. it could happen that you don't. Okay. So. Um, and this is yeah. not, like when we played it before, we didn't hide our cards. We were kind of like. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, you can do whatever. I'm going to give both Dan and Ryan the opportunity to do so if they want to, like, you know, do the big reveal and the surprise afterwards. <laughs> um, so are I you all... Draw any additional cards. What? I choose not to draw any additional cards. <laughs> Unless I okay. have to draw um, an I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I think I think for our online one I won't I won't force you to. Um so I think I think giving it as an option it's gonna be easier for online. Um what I am gonna do though now is I'm gonna do one more shuffle and then I'm gonna pass out pass out um Dan, myself and Ryan set real quick. Sounds so good. Since, since I see you two are already um maybe even good to go. <laughs> <laughs> In it. So. We were up with the dawn. We were ready for our, our hero's journey today. Yep. Yep. That's how it goes. Chris has got some good cards. I do. And I really want to use the draw mechanic, though, but I don't want to lose anything. All right. We just so one for me. For both of us. <laughs> And all right, so I have a draw pile that I don't actually know what continues on. I have my cards. Dan, I will send you yours first. Um, uh, let me open up this chat. I wonder if the private chat gets captured um, in the Zoom recording. I don't think it does, yeah. I don't think it does, but at the end, like it does, I don't think it'll matter because, um, We're like Halo, it with the story, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I like how a part of my backdrop, the meeting owl, is it decided <laughs> that that's a character, a person to look at. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I had a meeting yesterday. We did a a debrief with Danny because yesterday was her last day before she leaves for the summer. She's coming back in the fall, right? She's coming back in the fall after rush. Okay. Um, and uh, the whole time, it was just focused on me. Like I didn't see Katie or Liz or Danny. It was just like the meeting owl was just kind of like Chris is the only thing that exists in this world today. Cool. I think she she needs a name like Octavia or something like that. Um, but she definitely focuses on on certain people at certain times. I think she has a tough time with some of these rooms too, especially with like the giant screen. Like she'll hone in on people on the screen sometimes too. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to see if I can demonstrate. Like if it'll. So say something, Dan. Let me. I'm gonna put you in. Wait, hold on. I'm gonna put you in full screen view. Okay. Oh no. <laughs> I just want to see if she turns her turns herself. You see the owl turns to the monitor. I, uh, hmm. Yeah. Well, it doesn't look like it's uh, very interested. It might be <laughs> I look really distorted on that 360 view. <laughs> <laughs> the sound might be bouncing off of the speaker. Oh, it's bouncing around room. the room. And that is a separate person. Oh, let's see. Oh, I wonder. So the TV coming up as a. What? World? Sorry. You're all good. Uh, um, I made it. <laughs> awesome. Good to hear. Oh, I'm going to put it back. That was a fun experiment. <laughs> it, definitely, right. it definitely is down with my voice, my, my loud ass teacher voice. Doesn't like me. That, well, it was liking you before. See, look, like, she's just like, hey, Angela. <laughs> All right, Ryan, I sent you your four cards. Um, so basically, everyone, you have the opportunity to send me, um, which, like, if you have cards in your hands that you don't want to use, you are allowed to redraw twice. So you'll discard one and then redraw another um, is what you will have the opportunity to do. And I keep four? Yeah. So at the end, you'll, your story will be constructed of four cards. Okay. So I see 
five there. So I tell you which one I don't want. Um, no, those are one, two, three, four. No, you should have four. Those should be four. Oh yeah. Uh, sorry. Sorry. No, you're all good. You're all good. It's a little bit harder in that way. <laughs> so before you guys tuned in, Chris and I were talking about, um, uh, a thing that she found. It's like a, a meetup to test games. Yeah, so it's a, it, the meetup was called Break My Game or something like that. And they're <laughs> leading up to play test tabletop games that they're creating. Hmm. Which is great for my upcoming class. But I was like, oh, I, I want to go. I think that'd be interesting, I guess. Maybe. Depends on who. Like what games are brought? I mean, maybe we should all go as like a, as like a, a, a fun happy hour type of thing. That was gonna be my follow up. Was if it's held at like a brewery or something, I'm down because then there's like an. You're like I'm just gonna focus on this beer right now. <laughs> yeah, but imagine if the game just isn't very good, and you're like half, you know, one and a half sheets to the wind by the time you start giving them feedback. <laughs> this thing sucks. I'm going to draw one. Brian, you missed the, uh, Chris and I decided not to draw anything. We love our cards. You do what now? We love our cards. We have no changes. Oh, well, is one of you going <laughs> it alone? <laughs> Are, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> All right, I'm giving one back to Ryan. Thank you. And then I'm giving one back to Dan. At some point, I want to know what cards you guys gave back. <laughs> Talk about it at the end. <laughs> Sure. All right. Oh, it liked Keegan's voice. <laughs> it's weird because I'm like, I feel it's. Like on in front of me, if I'm playing three games at once, kind of. <laughs> Somebody's going to walk into that conference room and be like, what is he doing right now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> be quiet. I'm doing work. <laughs> I told you not to bother me when I'm cleaning my room. Mom, meatloaf. <laughs> Did either of you guys go to the um, to the SGN salon last night? No, there was an honors reception. Scheduled um, at the same time, and I totally forgot. I was unable because I had family stuff. Oh yeah, your sister was in town. Yep. Hmm. Any other um, draws from? Dan or Ryan? I think I'm good. <laughs> nah, I'm good. All right. Ian's thinking. Yeah, I am. So the one interesting okay. thing about since we're playing with two decks is that we may have some overlapping cards and then the original game did we play with one deck or two decks in the it depended on which um like originally the group i was in only had one deck but then we had folks come in late so like i added a second one so we did have repeats so i think yeah. in in reality that's probably more likely anyways because you're just never going to have like the four or five all the time but I think we're good to go, though. So um, does anybody want to go first? 
I'm still working on mine, so. Okay. <laughs> All right. If I not, I can go first. Yeah. Are you? Do you want to go first? I'll, I can go first too. Go for it, Angela. Okay. So my cards are. Actually, I'll, I'll do each card as part of the story. So my first card is the hero. Ooh. I have to do like <laughs> it's like what is a meeting owl like? Um, so the hero is the driver of the narrative and leader of the story, accepts the call to action, and often re represents our own struggles. And I'm supposed to describe who embodies this role in a course. What do they do? So I'm actually going to expand this. Um, the hero in, in this particular story is um, an administrator of a fully online program. And they have the hard call of figuring out how to um, expand or scale their operation. And my second card is the hero in the ordinary world. So a student moves from the known to the unknown. So in this case, it's not a student, it's this administrator. Um, they have a landscape right now where they have some buy-in for online. They have um, some faculty that are kind of cool with it. Um, they have some people on staff and they have a little bit of money that they can work with to hire folks. Um, it could be comfortable, like they could just use what they've got and kind of keep things informal and sort of low-key. Um, they could um, just try to see what comes at them and then determine like, okay, I'll, I'll just be reactive. Um, and it would be totally fine to do that. Um, no complaints, no nothing. Um, but my next card, so the commitment to leave for the journey, the hero commits to completing an assigned challenge. And then I was supposed to describe what proposals or plans did the person create to show their commitment to the completion of this challenge. So there have been these inklings of, okay, um, my institution can just sort of dabble in online and do a little bit, but um, this particular administrator says, you know what, I really got into this game because I was a non-traditional student um, when I sort of went up through the ranks, um, and I would not have been able to get to where I am now if I hadn't had the opportunity to study online. Um, and had the opportunity to study in a fully online program that was really strongly developed about higher ed leadership. And if it weren't for that program, I wouldn't have been able to pay my rent, you know, keep my kids in school, do all of these things, and also work towards my education to get to where I need to be. And um, the administrator is also part of a land grant institution that has a commitment to access. So it's like, all right, I have the ability to just sort of stay the course and do what I'm doing. But there's this bigger calling out there of like, how do I actually attach like the mission and the vision of the university and then my own personal passion for using um, education and particularly online education as a way to open new pathways for all sorts of other students. So the administrator makes a commitment to decide to scale up their office um, in some really big and strategic ways that they know are going to be incredibly intense because it's going to take buy-in from a lot of other people at the institution and it's probably going to mean asking for favors for new connections for um, all sorts of things that they hadn't really anticipated when they sort of saw um, you know the ordinary world as their little silo of like people come to us and we just sort of help um, and figure things out so one of the biggest things that the administrator had to do, and this is the, the reward, my final card, so administrator receives new knowledge, is they did um, some market analyses, some market studies around other institutions that were trying to ramp up and scale within the online game, looking at other institutions that had been super successful in the online game. And that was really the journey, was figuring out what that plan would be for them scaling specifically for that institution. And a lot of it had to do with, you know, saying, okay, this particular institution set their metric or their goal is having 150,000 students by this particular date. And this administrator was like, ah, eh, like that's not really our goal. It's, it, it might be 
might be a formidable goal and an honorable goal for somebody else, but that's not really our institution's goal. Um, and then looking at other institutions that said, hey, we decided to get rid of all of our um, OPMs, we decided to um, you know, actually build internally, we decided to um, leverage designers that were already on campus but maybe didn't have that moniker of instructional designer and figure out how to mentor them up into being a part of the online game. So a combination of receiving new information as the reward to sort of tailor what the actual strategic goal would be and then bringing that back to the institution to say, okay, I have all of these riches and resources that I have to put together in order to stand up this program. The end. Sounds <laughs> really good. <laughs> yeah. And now is an opportunity to, you know, where, you know, uh, ask questions, be in discussion, um, do any of that for just Angela's narrative in general. Um, I think I'll start it off. Um, I see a lot of um, maybe parallels with, uh, uh, well, of course, right, with your experience and, and particularly your institution. Um, would you have like um, knowing what you know and from kind of the, the, the trajectory of the story that, that you told of the narrative that you told, what pieces of advice would you give towards um, folks that are like at the beginning of that journey? Like what, what, you know, are there any things like learned or any things that, um, that might just be like, hey, watch out for this that you think come into play for you? I think there are two biggies. So one, having um, your administrator or having people that speak to that administrator understand what a business model is for the online enterprise enough to be able to speak to department heads and deans about how that could be organized gives the latitude and freedom to, um, to build in a way that um, is not only appropriate and responsible and um, scalable for institutions, but also is built within the culture of the mission and the goals. And I really, like I lean on that word culture because I think that all of us, you know, we're kind of trying to do the same things, but we're doing it in very different ways. And the, the different ways are uniqueness, are the uniqueness of our identities and the work that we're, you know, that we're, we're doing together that are imbued with our unique goals. And I think we lose sight of that sometimes. So that's, that's one big thing of like set up the business models so that you can build things in a way that is specifically meaningful and useful to the student populations that you're serving um, and not just making assumptions about you know, what you're doing and who those folks are. And then the other piece is, um, if you have challenges along the way, make sure that you are talking to other institutions because I guarantee you somebody out there has had that same, that same obstacle already. It's sort of like your allies on the, the hero's journey. Um, somebody might have cleared a chasm <laughs> right before, somebody might be in the chasm. They're like, do not <laughs> go in this direction. This is really bad. So our connections and the way that we communicate and really being transparent and honest about our failures is super important too. So as long as we're contributing to the effort of saying, hey, this was a bad idea. We signed this seven year contract with this company and now we can't get out of it. Um, don't do that. Or we didn't do this. We decided to build internally or we stood up this team in this way or we got the strategic investment in this way. Just being open about all of those conversations and all of those things is super, super important. This is the teacher's silence where I wait for anyone that wants to jump in with their thoughts and or discussion. You can't teach your silence teachers. <laughs> Actually, it does, it does work because I don't like to speak up usually when I'm in learning mode and I do if I feel like there's another teacher up there that's just like struggling. I'm like, okay, I'll say something. Yeah. <laughs> I think we do that. That was good. Yeah, yeah, that was good. That was good. Um, cool. I'm updating Ryan. I vote Ryan in tribute. <laughs> Me? 
I think I'm going to go last because my story is good to end on. Okay. So just just throwing it out there too. The hubris, Keegan, the hubris. <laughs> I'm, I'm all for that good video, right? <laughs> Keegan's like, I'm dessert. Okay, let's see. Get some theme music going. <laughs> As we delve into the journey. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so, I had um, initially I was thinking about my 406 class, the uh, the game development course that I'm doing right now, and kind of the uh, <clears throat> the students' experience in that because it was a, a course that I built like a year ago. Uh, hadn't taught it until just now, so this is my very first time doing it. Um, and it's some of you know this. It's uh, a little different than the typical class. Uh, it's very self-directed. Uh, students have experience points. It's, it's gamified. It's a game development course that is entirely gamified. Um, and they are, you know, they can go through this journey however they want. So I give them, uh, you know, dozens of opportunities with eight or nine different kinds of assignments that they can do. And there's certain, uh, I don't want to say, well, how do I put it? Um, it's like in a video game where if you, you kill the same monster at level one and you do it level five. The, huh? Diminishing returns? Well, I didn't want to say diminishing returns because I feel like that's it makes it less useful that they do it multiple times. Uh, but the, the amount of points and the amount of, of experience points that they get each time that they repeat the same assignment goes down because the levels have set increments right for the grade so they do like a mini demo and the first time they do it they can get 300 points for it they do another one exact same assignment just different content uh the maximum they can get is 150 next one 75 next one 50 that kind of thing and that's the whole course except for a couple things are like that um the other part to it is that there are kind of i call it cool down periods so like you have to wait a certain number of days until that quest is available again. So you can't just do 15 things and turn them in on the same day. You, you know, you have to submit them. You have to wait four days, say between assignments. And that's to kind of enforce a, uh, time to grow and time to think and time to do other things between these different assignments. Um, for the students that work like that, it's awesome. Some students, uh, it really didn't work very well. Uh, so I have to rethink that. But, um, as in the terms of the hero's journey, uh, I had the approach. So, um, let me bring the thing back up here. Uh, so, yeah, I have the PDF. <laughs> Thank you, Keegan. Uh, describe, did you give students specific criteria that they were required to use in conjunction with the completion of assignments? Um, the biggest one, I mean, I, I put everything online. I give them not really specific requirements because as a game development course, I have students using Twine, I have students using Unity, I have students using Construct, I have students just straight up coding in JavaScript. So the difficulty is giving them really specific requirements that are also broad enough to apply to all these different kind of contexts that they're in and the different kind of games that they want to make. Some are literary, some one is a, a 2D scrolling platformer, one is a top down, really complicated puzzle game. Um, so the main, uh, the main criteria that I use for the students in terms of their assignments is impress me, you know, make something that you are actually proud of. I'm not super concerned about the nitpicky things that you might find in a rubric, uh, simply because again, you, it has to be broad enough to apply to everybody and all the different things they're doing. And I don't want to stifle their creativity and say, no, you can't do that because I'm only willing to assess in this way. So, so the big thing is. If you're going to show me something and you're going to show your classmates something, it should be impressive. You should be proud of it. Um, the next one I got was the ordeal. Let's describe what tasks did students uh, accomplish in order to successfully, successfully complete the assignment. Um, and like I said, much of it is up to them. Right? So um, I give them uh, the place that I want them to end up in, but I show them dozens of ways to get there. So say you... Uh, you really like the coding and the mechanics of it, then you can do a bunch of mini demos and not as much of, say, the uh, developer 
Spotlight, which is a, an, an assignment where they uh, find a, a game developer, research them, look at the games they've made, look at their, you know, how they've progressed over time, or uh, the development Teardown, where they watch a, uh, either play or watch kind of the video game equivalent of a DVD director's commentary, right? Where you have the developer sit around and talk about the game. I get a lot of these from like GDCs, they call them postmortems, um, where they do those. And then they reply, you know, they record their reactions to the developer commentary, right? So they can actually see these people, what they're doing in the world, you know, and they're reflecting on their own work. So it's very meta. Um, so they, they can do all sorts of combinations of these things. So if they gravitate more towards, say, project management and less about coding, then they can do the developer commentaries. You know, if they really want to code, then they can do the mini demos. Um, so they, you know, the, the way that they get there is very much up to them. Uh, the Call to Adventure was my next one. And describe how did you introduce the module or unit to the students or that the students were asked to complete? Thank you, Keegan. Uh, I teach, this class is fully online, so it's, it, being fully online, uh, I also have synchronous meetings. So in these synchronous meetings, it's very much like a traditional classroom kind of lectury thing. One of my students called it an interactive lecture because it's, you know, there's, they have the assignments, they have the syllabus, they have the content, they have everything they need. And then what I do in class is kind of a postmortem, kind of that, where I kind of, expand on it and give them supplemental stuff and do, you know, back and forth and answer questions and things like that. Explain things in ways that maybe the written document doesn't, which is how I encourage them to come to class. <laughs> if you come, you're going to have a much better time because you're going to know stuff that you wouldn't know otherwise. Crazy idea, right? Um, so that's, that's how I encourage them to come join the adventure. And the, uh, my final one was the wise elder and Honestly, the wise elder, uh, who embodies the role, the role is, you know, the guidance that, uh, they give guidance to the hero, uh, when they need it provides key knowledge that is integral to the hero's success. Um, I think the instructor should play in part that role because they're the, you know, they built the course, they, they're the content knowledge, you know, the content area expert and stuff. But in this course, uh, not only are all these different game developers that the students are researching and talking about and presenting on, uh, not only are they the wise elders, but also the students themselves with each other, because virtually everything that we do, I have them put their finished product in, uh, in our Slack team where the students can then see what everybody else is doing, not at the assessment or anything like that, uh, but at least share their work with each other. So not only are the students learning from the things that they are going out and doing, but also learning from one another asynchronously throughout the semester. So it's handy if you have a student that's like, you know, I don't really know what to do with this assignment. Like I know what the requirements are, but I'm just not feeling it. You know, they can then see the work that another student has done and use that as inspiration. So in that way, the students are each other's wise elders to an extent. And that is my journey. Hey. I have a comment and a question. <laughs> Hold your applause. Um, so I think that it's not to say that it's not um, an incredibly strong metaphor to have the student as epic hero and faculty as wise elder, but I just think it's it's common. It's one of like the the ones that we first see, you know, when mm -hmm. we we approach narrative in, um, in online learning. And I love the way that you recontextualized the wise elder as being a collective of people, perhaps, also some things. So like Chris produces an artifact um, or she produces an assignment. I see her example and that's the wise elder um, because that gives me the assurance that I'm, I'm good, like I can do this. I see a clear path, even though ostensibly, Ryan, you wrote the best instructions of all time. You, you, you know, you explained it really clearly, like what I need to do, but I still have some uncertainty and doubts as to whether I can do it. But, but that object that, that Chris has put in into the, the discussion board, she's turned it in. I'm like, oh, okay, like, I'm not going to copy her, but like now I kind of see how she carved up the same, the same assignment that I did. So I thought that was really cool that you said that. And I had a question that was related to that. Um, in that model, 
the wise elder is not established in the same way or revealed to the students in the same way um, as it might be if you have this sort of like faculty student relationship, right? Where the student knows, all right, the wise elder is my faculty member who's guiding me. And I would just ask you and maybe everybody, do you think that um, there is some strength, some benefit in the wise elder not necessarily being revealed? So maybe the wise elder is sort of in the shapeshifter role of like, you don't necessarily know who it is that's guiding you along the way until you get to this pivotal sort of moment in the journey where it's all is revealed that like <laughs> that this secret or this key that you needed was the wise elder all along. I mean, I think so. I, I I think it's like you said at the beginning. It's it's kind of boring if it's just the the faculty is the wise one and the hero is the student and and that's it. I I think that in a in a context like this, especially in in I, maybe online education just more generally, I think that the uh, the wise elder could benefit from just being constructed over time from a number of different things and a number of different places and ideas and and whatnot. And if there is a time where it's like Oh, you can see it. That's fine. But you know, it, every student's different. Every class is different. I, how it gets revealed over time, how it gets constructed is not going to be the same in every class. It's not going to be the same for every student, you know, cause they're doing their own individual work. So that's, that's actually part of the problem with that model is that the, you know, if you put a lot of emphasis on that, you have no real guarantee that it is going to happen. You know, that it's going to, that it's going to click for one of the students. Maybe for the majority of them it does, but for a few they're like, yeah, I just never got it. You know? So, I don't know, it's a good question. In my D&D class, I use the students and their experiences as the wise elder. So, in this course, they're going through and they're I'm using D&D mechanics for them to kind of explore social issues. So, one of them is um, environmental issues. So they, they're in this post-apocalyptic world, they're trying to survive as a survivor group. And the way that this department's set up is it's a first year seminar. So um, I get everything from first year chemistry students to students who just generally have no idea what they want to do, but they're kind of interested in all these different things. And so as they're facing these different problems, like first the bugs kind of go crazy. And like, what are we going to do now that we're being like, biblical portion mass plague of locusts coming into our development. How are we going to handle this? And the interesting thing is like my students will go in and they'll start to deal with this problem. And then like the, the bio student is like, wait, wait, I think, can we eat locusts? I think we can eat locusts. Let's eat them. Um, and just kind of allowing the students to, to use their interests and in stuff that they already know as a way to kind of navigate the game and to navigate the content because then now they have it in their mind that, okay, we have a locust and, and um, mosquito problem. How can we handle this? What are some natural ways we can do this that aren't going to completely screw over? Then they go home and do research and they come back as even more of an expert because now they know like, okay, so last time we did the wrong thing, we really need to plant lavender around our place. And not only will it smell good, it'll drive away the mosquitoes. And so they come in as these, with all of this amazing, weird Foxfire-esque knowledge, um, <laughs> like homesteading, prepper kind of stuff, but they come in with all of this knowledge and they remember it. Like I'm getting messages on Facebook from former students who are like, yeah, I just moved into my first apartment and I really wanted to find a way to naturally debug the place, so I did what I learned in your class. Thank you. <laughs> But like other things, so, so teaching them how to, uh, they go out and they research all of these different social issues as well. And it's like, well, you know, I found this research that blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden I have freshmen who aren't really interested in anything political, having great political conversations where they're able to speak and be intelligent about the stuff that they're speaking about. And I don't know, so I'll keep going if you want. <laughs> I, it, Ryan, your story, so yeah, to Chris's point of keeping going, you know, your story I think really prompted a lot of thoughts about um, what do these roles actually mean in a constructivist environment? What do these roles actually mean about like, or within side quests and sort of other, I don't even want to call them side quests because I think that you establish outcomes in a course, right? But then there are other 
outcomes that are socially constructed, um, both you know amongst individual students, collectively across groups of students, and then collectively as a class that we can't necessarily plan for, but um, that are awesome. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. too, one of the things that like is really fun about just this activity in general is not only like the the monomyth, not only the the hero's journey pieces, but like through your story, I learn a lot about your course and what you're doing. And one of the things that really struck me is the impress me assignment approach. Like to me, that's really kind of interesting. So just a real quick question. Um, what, what advice would you give either to faculty members like to try something like that or maybe like move in that direction or maybe not even faculty members, maybe like their support folks like instructional designers and people as to like how to engage in that conversation? Like what is it, what is it that I guess both drove you to that and or how do you think it would benefit other folks? How basically all of those questions into, into one, one thing. I don't know. I mean, I think I, I think I've mentioned this before, but I can't remember where I think one of the most important texts that prepared me to become a teacher and to love teaching was Stanislavski's An Actor Prepares because teaching is performance, right? First and foremost. And there's a passion that comes with that. And there's also a messiness and a, and a creativity. You know, nothing is ever perfect. The best laid plans of mice and men, right? Like you can have the, the most perfect learning outcomes figured out when you're designing the course and, and learning objectives and, and assignments and, and assessments. But if you're not willing to just kind of get a little loose with your idea of what should be happening, that what you think is best for the students, then you, you might as well just have a checklist. You know, it's not actually education at that point. It's just training, which, and I know that there's, that's another discussion, but it's, you know, the issue of education is one-on-one, -on -one, right? It's always, two people learning together. You can, you can be in a group, right? And you can learn from each other, but it's always a dialogue, which I guess a duologue in that case, um, <laughs> especially in online education, because typically it's one person at a computer experiencing it on their own, right? And discussions are great and wonderful and they're very useful, but we have to remember that, you know, it isn't it ultimately probably at the end of the day, what's happening is it's an audience of one and Every audience is different. Every student is different. Every, you know, it's constructivism 101. Um, so the advice, I guess, for, for faculty is just be willing to kind of, like I said, get, get a little loose, you know, uh, not be super strict in what you want <laughs> students to do. And for the instructional designers having to deal with a faculty that don't want to do that, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, I feel so bad. Some ideas. <laughs> That's a good segue to Dan. <laughs> Dan's like, no, don't come. Uh. <laughs> I was, I was going to ask you too, Dan, like, what is the percentage of folks that come in that are just like, yes, I want to try all this stuff. I mean, it's not, it's not usually that way. Like, I think we have to start from this place. <laughs> folks having a lot of apprehension and preconceived notions of, of what's going to happen. It's true, very true. But I like the sound of your class, Ryan. I would love to have taken that. You know, when I was debating what I was going to go back to school for, it was either game design or instructional design. <laughs> well, it's it's online. I'll put the uh, I'll put the course link in the in the chat for you, if, right. you want, if you want to browse it. Cool. Well, who wants to go next between Dan and Chris? Dan, you want to go? Oh, man. <laughs> I'm not sure. Sure, I've got much uh, to elaborate on as you guys do. <laughs> Mine's going to be pretty short, so it's, it's a okay. Okay. All right. Well, we'll try it. We'll see if I'm way off base here. And <laughs> now we're supposed to do this. So um, I have the Herald. Um, announces the journey and sets the epic into motion. 
In this case, uh, it is not a person. Well, it comes from a person, but it's an email that somebody gets that says, you have been selected to put this course online. <laughs> um, it is a lab course and good luck with that. <laughs> and so this message gets sent to our hero who is an instructor and the hero again is the uh, driver of the narrative leader of the story except the call to action so yeah this is our instructor who gets that email and says okay well uh, i've got to do this i've been following told to do it uh, i guess i got to figure out how to do it <laughs> um so let me check here so this instructor has taught online before, but this class is different. They've never taught a class like this online. Uh, when they taught online before, they had worked with an instructional designer, and uh, but with a class that had already been established and was taught by another instructor who basically handed the class off to them. So um, their experience with the instructional designer was not super solid, but they knew that they had an instructional designer. So they went to their instructional designer, who is their ally in this case. That was another card I had. It's just the hero in their journey. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so this instructional designer, uh, I've been working with them and trying to help them uh, um, improve their course and the last course that they'd worked on together because you know was being handed off for another instructor didn't didn't work out so well for the instructor and they realized that <laughs> and then they had also begun to realize that a lot of the things the instruction designer had said to them panned out exactly the way he had warned them about <laughs> um and so she went to the instruction designer and said hey i need help building this class and uh i really want a lot more of your input this time so we can try and make it as, as good as it can be. And she's like, I have no idea how to um, do this course online with the labs. How are we gonna get these labs, students do these labs remotely? We have them come into a physical space where they can do this stuff. And this was a, a nutrition course. And uh, so they had to cook stuff is kind of what it was. Well, I mean, so we had to establish that these people taking this class online had a kitchen to work in somewhere. Uh, that just had to be a requirement. And so they worked together. The, um, what was my last one? Was the encouraged by a mentor, right? And so that's kind of what I'm getting into here. The, providing guidance, resources, context, and encouragement. Um, and so this instructor kept doubting her ability to do things online. She didn't know how to use the LMS very well. She didn't know how to use a lot of the functionality that it had. She, you know, that she had, while she taught online before, again, it was a handed off class and that's the only class she'd really taught online. And so, um, again, I think the encouraged part of, of men, I don't know about mentor, but encouraged part was the instructional designer continually just showing her how to do things, encouraging her that she could do it. You know, it's not, it wasn't that hard. Walk through the steps a few times, work through the assignments, the activities that we, she had ideas for. She started having really great ideas. She just wasn't needed just an extra push over the edge and how to get it to work online. And um, so we ended up with the instructor having them perform these labs, record videos of them cooking this uh, portions of, actually they took pictures at portions, certain spots in their production of the, the food that they were preparing. And then they produced a video at the end talking about their experience with it, answering certain questions uh, that were posed to them about, you know, and a lot of them were things like, what would they do differently next time? How did it turn out, you know, compared to similar things that you've had before? Uh, things like that. And then they would post it onto a discussion forum where they'd share it with the other students and they could comment on each other's procedures and practices and how they were actually preparing food and stuff. Um, and so it was interesting because it worked out pretty well to the point that before the semester had even ended, she was getting calls from other universities where people wanted to ask her how she had gotten this class online. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. 
So that's, I really that's like, my story. <laughs> I really like it because it seems like it's, it's so real to me. Cause even like the small details, like the, like we're in situations right now where we have folks that, you know, they may have gone through their building of an online course the first time. And then, you know, like they have their opinions about how it's going to go and stuff. And then after their experience, they're like, Oh, what you said had some value in it and some merit and let me listen and let's do some of this stuff together some more. And like, like that's, it's just such a very real thing that I feel. Um, I mean, it's, it's something we experience. I, I imagine that other folks at these tables have similar, similar things. So, but yeah, it's, that's definitely one of my, one of my favorite parts about uh, what you said, Dan. I just wanted to echo that sentiment and say that the common thread um, throughout the entire story was authenticity. And I, I think that that's something that we definitely need to champion within our field and all of our connection points and relationships is how authentic are we being? How transparent are we being about the things that we do? And sometimes um, that means sharing fears and apprehension. So I just think about how that story that we wouldn't have um, played out if the instructor hadn't come in and said that I have, um, I had a poor experience before with building an online course. I have doubts about building an online course, but I'm open to engaging with you, the instructional designer. But I also think that there's this other piece on the instructional design side of, I have a lot of recommendations and guidance for how um, you might build this class, you, the faculty, might build this class, but I also have a lot of questions, and they're questions that we need to answer together. So it's not like anybody is posturing of like, I've got it all figured out, and like, here's what we're going to do. It's this back and forth, and then the same thing as this, you know, the, the course is being developed, the students are in the course, the students are engaging in these behaviors that are active and experiential, they're going to have doubts. So like, how do you build room for, for that within the course where it's like, yeah, you're confused and that's okay. Like, and you're going to be confused for a little while longer and then you're going to figure it out and you're going to be like, oh my gosh, this is incredible because you did it for yourself. So I thought that was really cool. And I just think that anytime we have reminders to just like own that this is messy and own that, that sometimes we don't know which way to go. We've got to try it out and Maybe we're going to fail a little bit and then back up and then go in another direction. That's legit. That's like totally legit. I think that that's good. So I really like that in your story. It also felt super real. <laughs> cool. Well, one, one more. You Chris, are you ready for this? Or um, one more. So my story is actually about the course that I am finishing up teaching right now for NAU. Um, it is a course on Doctor Who, um, and the purpose of the course is we're supposed to explore the human condition as it's presented within Doctor Who. Um, and I, the way I have it set up is there's two discussions. They, I'm supposed to build community. That's a, a big part of this whole first year seminar is to kind of bring them together and get them talking to each other and get them into these academic conversations. So I had constructed it originally that there would be a fun question and then there'd be like the academic question. And my fun questions had been stuff like, you know, if you could choose invisibility or reading minds, which one would you choose and why? And then we could talk about like the ethics of dealing with other people or the ethics of conversation. Um, but what I did this time a little bit differently was I brought back an idea that I had before of building a game into my class because, <laughs> um, you know, I don't ever do that ever. Um, and so what I had done was uh, my first card is the shapeshifter. So it says the shapeshifter is a character with unclear motivations can blur the line between ally and enemy. And so what I wanted to do was kind of keep them guessing as to what's happening in these first discussions. And so what the discussion does is it presents them with a story and you're the companion and you're with the doctor. Um, and I didn't pick a specific doctor because I have classic fans. And, and <laughs> so the doctor's actually me and, and we're going through and we're adventuring through these different worlds. 
And so I present them with a problem or a scenario and they have to react to it. Um, so that brings in the, the trickster. So the, the problem, the trickster says, the trickster is the creator of drama or complexity on the journey, often has good intentions that create a challenge. So as they're going through, they have to remember everything that they did in the other worlds and everything that they remembered to bring it to this new world. Um, and so there's a complexity as, as you're realizing that you're navigating these worlds with bias I'm trying to force them to face their own bias. So it's, it's introducing the complexity of themselves in these, these different worlds that are created by somebody who has their own bias, but then there's like the challenge of, of facing that bias and trying to choose what is good for that particular instance. Um, which brings me to, to my, my one place card, which is approach. Um, approach is the student prepares to answer the question, did you give students specific criteria that they were required to use in conjunction with the completion of the assignment? So did I give them criteria on how to, to answer these questions um, and, and how to kind of navigate this? And this is where I feel like I kind of failed. Um, I, it was a thought experiment. It was a 16 week thought experiment. And um, you have some students who want to engage with it and they'll write these like 3,000 word discussion boards of everything that they're going to do, describing everything totally in it. But then you have some of these students who were like, I didn't sign up for a gaming course. I'm not comfortable in this space. You're making me question too much. I don't like it. No. Um, and so you get like these three word responses is I would kill everybody. <laughs> or um, there, I obviously this means a lot to you. You're spending a lot of time on it. So I'm going to go ahead and throw you a bone. I'll, I'll write you like, three sentences. I would ask them questions. I would help them solve their problem at the end. Um, and so I ended up having to put more and more criteria as a part of it, but it was taking away the authenticity of the experience. Um, but my the, the last card that I got was the Guardian. And the Guardian tests the hero before progressing through their challenge often harkens to trials ahead. Um, and, and this was kind of, I saw this card as kind of how I had positioned those narratives and those discussions is that I wanted to challenge them to think about it. So that way when they come in and they write these papers, they're writing from a position of authenticity and a position of, I have already reflected on this the whole week and from this mindset of, I was involved in this world and this thing was going on and this is how I felt. And here's the research that I did and here's the, the episode that I chose to kind of show my thought process. Um, so yeah, um, I, I was hoping that, that those discussions would kind of play into that. And for a lot of my students, they did. And for the students that are very much, I needed this liberal arts credit and I thought it would be easy watching Doctor Who and you weren't gonna make me think too much about it, it was kind of a challenge for them. So rejiggering everything for the next iteration so that it's, it's a bit more meaningful for all of the students. I know I won't hit them all, but. I'll jump in because I'm curious, like, um, like since you are reflecting on some of these things and you are um, already kind of aware of what it is that you want to work on and stuff, do you have initial thoughts of like, um, I, for lack of a better word, solutions and or like, you know, <laughs> um, I don't know. Like, what are your what are your initial thoughts? I'm just curious too. My initial thought was to go Jane McGonagall and create an opt-in. Like, do you want the gamed experience or do you want the traditional class experience? Because I have to realize that my students that are in this course, even though it's a first year seminar, they're not all traditional first year students. Uh, especially because my course is the only first year seminar that's online. Um, I need to understand that some of my students are the 35 year old woman who has three special needs kids at home and is a Navy wife and might not really think that playing is a good way to, to learn. So creating that opt in to where they can opt into an experience, which doubles my work um, for, for a semester at least while I build the story and, and revamp the story. Um, as far as other solutions besides making myself work to death, I'm not 100% sure. Maybe just creating it as, as a, an optional assignment 
uh, instead of writing the weekly reflections, you can partake in this game and um, come and come and play with me as we explore our worlds. I wonder if you back off of telling them that it's a game and build it in a way that seems a little bit more like the environment that students are expecting, but still have them engage in the same tasks, um, if that might be more successful. Because I think that for a lot of folks, it's not that they're opposed to playing a game per se, it's just um, the cognitive dissonance of I enrolled in a class, I've been um, indoctrinated into a system that says that learning is X, and then you're coming in and saying, surprise, Dorothy, you're in Oz. Learning can be, you know, flurgan. Like, just it's not even like, you know, why. It's like just something completely like crazy. So it's, it's more of an extension or a leap for some people to, to meet you where you're at. Um, so how could you break it down so that people that are not used to games or are maybe not open to the, I mean, even this that we're doing right now, like, there are people that would have a ton of apprehension about sitting around and sharing practice and talking about um, online learning within the context of what is ostensibly a game. Like I don't, I don't deal in, you know, <laughs> I don't deal in these types of constructs, right? So how how could we, how could we rethink um, that class experience to be something that is inclusive mm -hmm. um, of folks that might have apprehension or anxiety about doing those different tasks? and breaking down the tasks so it's really a little bit more formulated towards what they might know already, but still get that same outcome. And those types of constructs too, like it's weird because like games have that special thing of where like they also bleed into people's identity. Like when we've done, um, uh, I, I've done a, a session in the past called Goblin and one of the first like, intro questions we ask or um, like while we're like getting to know each other and you know like at the very beginning of sparking community is like hey what's everybody's favorite game and usually we always have someone that says well I don't like games and we're like well like do you watch soccer or like do you play cards with your family or like what so it's like I don't know it's just one of those things that's like it's got a weird like embedded into like who people feel they are too so it's like it's hard and it's a stretch in that way as well it's charged you know i think that that's kind of like there's a lot of imposter syndrome around that mm -hmm. um i think which is excluding and uh <laughs> when it really is just like hey everybody come on in and let's do this together that's really what you're asking folks to do it's a thought experiment yeah Hate. <laughs> I did. I did um, tell my husband about the class that um, I built that has gameful elements in it, and I said, "Would you like this class?" And he was like, "Absolutely not," because you spend a lot of time saying, "Don't worry about your grade. Focus on learning these concepts." And I just want you to tell me what to do is like a list, and then I'm going to do them, and then I'm not going to be in your class anymore, and then it's going to be great. <laughs> and like that's his, you know, that's what he wants to do. That's what he's coming in with, which is legit. Like, how do I answer that student who is like, give me the laundry list? And I, it's my, it's still my responsibility to make sure that student learns. Like, I don't, I, I can't necessarily change their mind about grades, especially if they've spent how many years, if they've spent decades being told that grades are the only things that matter. Like, for me to think that I'm going to be able to change that in 15 weeks, like, that's bold. It doesn't mean I'm not going to try to do it, but it's it's hard. It's really hard. So. Cool. Well, I think I'll close this up then. Yes. I want right. to if we could. Um, no, go. Just go. Okay. <laughs> All right. So my story is actually. Um, I was trying to think of what to do, and mine's actually going to be around this game and this play is what it is. Um, so my first card was the reluctance to accept the call. Um, students pose initial questions related to the challenge. Um, and that's what we all did today. That's what I asked you all to do today as you were joining on this journey of playing this. And while you joined on this journey, there were several 
tricksters about. Um, there was me asking, you know, you to, to think about online learning in a way that you maybe not have before or come up with a narrative around your your work, a new perspective that you maybe wouldn't have seen otherwise. Um, and the trickster comes into play because not only are you doing that, you're limited by four prompts and that's all you get, right? So like that, that kind of melds it down that, that um, into what it is. And there's also randomization on all those things too, but that's, a, that's something else. Um, and then um, I also had the resurrection, which is where students become aware of the importance and implications of the new knowledge that they have. So my hope and desire is that after having experienced this, um, that you kind of have uh, uh, an understanding of where narrative might not always seem like it would fit in, could come into play, things like that. Um, and then on top of that is the return. Students show knowledge as a means of uh, improving the experience of others. So taking what you might have learned in something like this and applying it outwardly into either your work or your interactions with other folks um, and, you know, everything related to that. Because at the end of the day, all this really is, all we've really come to do is uh, further ourselves so we can better serve our students. So that's that's mine. Did you pick these cards? <laughs> I did not. I did not. He cared. I did not. He was the game master. <laughs> I mean, I guess you couldn't have seen what I drew. But I still, yeah. Um, we need to I take Keegan to Vegas. A randomized deck over here and everything else. So it's fine. You have to trust me. You have to trust me. That's great. Unreliable Mary. Never trust the man who holds the cards. <laughs> <laughs> so just a couple final thoughts to leave you with um, as I reflect on the work that has all come together, but the, really more importantly, the knowledge that was created from all of the work that we engaged in together um, and how it relates to just multimodal learning in general. The first and foremost is that I think that we underestimate the nuanced nature, the subtle nature, the detailed nature of our communications and how multimodal they are beyond just things like um, nonverbal communication, but also color and movement and balance and a lot of the principles that we leverage uh, around visual literacy and visual thinking um, or visual communications, all of that comes into play every day, every way. And I think that we sort of, um, you know, miss it. We, we don't necessarily see those pieces and calling it out and helping people call it out is super important in building a foundation of um, an understanding of communication. In addition, um, when we think about how much work we do, how much we communicate and liaise within digital environments, within digital spaces, we don't necessarily take into account the unique affordances and the constraints of connecting in these environments. So certainly the affordances with the multimodal synthesis, uh, being able to play a game with people that are all over the country, amazing. Um, constraints would be figuring out how to modify gameplay for a game that has physical cards and um, also has people that are located in different places that might um, limit the way that they can see, hear, and interact within that game. Um, coming in with that approach of saying, okay, what are the things that I can do? What are the things that I can't do? And not applying those first, but really looking at the outcomes for what you want of a particular situation, and then um, figuring out how those pros and cons can come into play, super important. Of course, um, technology, particularly all of the emerging technology tools, all of the free tools, the tools that establish us as creators are amazingly powerful. Um, they're pushing all of the boundaries for how we define connection and communication. And they can help us do things that might not have otherwise been possible before. 
But the flip of that coin is that technology isn't really um, the heart of the solution to all of our challenges and can also pose um, all sorts of unique and distinct challenges. It's just one ingredient in a recipe um, and focusing on the recipe itself is super, super important. And again, if we're thinking about that recipe, if we're thinking about, um, you know, what is our main goal? <laughs> our goal is to make a delicious quiche. Our goal is to um, build some sort of interpersonal community in the online learning environment, whatever it is, I think we have to focus at the, um, at that intended outcome and then couple technology and couple approaches after that, not first. Um, a lot of people want to lean on tech first, and that's and that's um, a big problem. I think it's the it's the root of a lot of our challenges that we have when we're when we're stumbling through whether uh, a, a lesson or um, a learning environment is effective in in meeting outcomes. So taking this approach of looking at the people, looking at the stakeholders first, and then um, building from there has to be the heart of it all. So with that, I leave you. Um, I left my contact information here if you have any questions, but uh, it's been a pleasure putting together all of these really, really big ideas into this multimodal synthesis. And I'm really excited to see how uh, new knowledge and new ideas might continue to expand and grow all of the things that um, I've been able to develop and learn anew. Um, with all of these various projects.